Laura Jordan Bombach, Mark Earls, Danielle Fiendaka, and Scott Morrison. Creative superpowers. Equip yourself for the age of creativity. We live in an age of digitalization and globalization. Innovation is the new normal. If you want to keep pace with the breakneck speed of technological breakthroughs, you'd better be prepared to run. That means there's never been a higher premium on creativity. It's the edge everyone's looking for in a world defined by its endless desire for the newfangled and unique. It's also the one thing humans can still do better than machines and robots. But there's a problem. Getting in touch with your creative side can be tricky. How do you learn to think creatively? Well, as the crack team behind this guide to hacking your creativity show, a good place to start is to clear up a common misconception. Creativity isn't about originality. It's about adding value. Take a look at the history of great inventions, and you'll soon see that what their creators had in common was an ability to make surprising links between things that already existed and connect the dots in unexpected ways. Learning to do that is all about cultivating an open-minded approach that embraces randomness, chance, and serendipity. And that's something everyone can learn. Blink number one. The key to creativity isn't stuffing your head with information, but rather learning to collaborate with others. School is all about learning facts. Know them by heart, the thinking seems to go, and you'll be set for life. But there's a much better approach you can use. Listening carefully to the people around you, taking note of the things that resonate most with you, and trusting your creative instincts. Creativity isn't about amassing knowledge. Lots of information doesn't make you more creative. In fact, it might end up making you less creative. Why? Well, the more you know about something, the more limits there are to how you think about it. Consider the taxi industry. Taxi companies have long pondered how to renew their industry. But the most innovative shakeup came from outside the sector. It was Uber, a new company intent on opening up the taxi market to car owners and commuters, that really pushed the envelope. That's partly because Uber's ideas were fresh. Its strategies weren't limited by tried and tested ideas about how to run a taxi business, which freed them up to think creatively. The result? A brand new service. The second path to creativity is to find someone to bounce your ideas off. Think of it this way. Whatever it is that you're planning, two people will always have more ideas than one. And that means it's important to think carefully about who you'd like to work with. Say you need a video for your new website. If you know a brilliant video artist, start a collaboration. Once you've figured out who can help you achieve success, give them a call and start convincing them to join you. There are exceptions, of course, but they're generally rare. In most cases, you'll find that you're much more creative when you're working together with others. This is called the sandbox model of creativity. Think of children interacting in a sandbox. Innovations come thick and fast. If one toddler starts burrowing into one side of a mound of sand, one of his playmates is likely to start digging from the other side. Voila, suddenly there's a tunnel. That's a great example of the way creativity works in a team. Blink number two. Boost your creativity by ditching old ideas and getting enough rest and relaxation. Everyone treasures their favorite possessions, and there are a few things more precious than something you've created. After all, it's your baby. That's a natural mindset, but it's often unhelpful. Your best work is frequently the result of letting go. This is especially true of ideas. Thinking creatively is all about new solutions, and to get there, you'll need to throw out ideas that just don't work. Think of it like a cupboard. If you want to free up space for new things, you also have to toss out some of your old belongings. Take it from the group of Japanese artists behind the 2016 hit Xylophone in the Forest ad for cell phone provider Docomo. It's an impressive spot. In it, a ball rolls down a 44-meter-long wooden xylophone suspended over a forested hillside. As it makes its way toward the instrument's final key, the ball plays the notes of a famous Bach composition to create a beautiful soundtrack. But that wasn't the artist's first idea. In fact, they argued for something much more complex. They were particularly taken by the idea of a Rube Goldberg-type machine, a device that completes a simple operation in the most complicated way possible. Rather than having the ball travel straight down the xylophone, the artists imagined a complex path involving all sorts of twists and turns, levers and special effects. 
It was a tantalizing idea, and the group invested considerable time into making it work. In the end, however, the project's leader, Morihiro Hirano, an advertising and media expert, overruled them. He was convinced a simpler version would be better. The ad was a huge success in Japan and made a splash in the international press. It was a fitting reward for a tough decision, rejecting the artist's original idea. Getting the creative juices flowing isn't just about being bold, though. It's also about setting yourself up for success. That means getting enough rest and relaxation. Your brain doesn't just shut down when you sleep. In fact, it remains quite active. Sleep is when the brain gets down to the important work of organizing memories and weaving dreams, and those are potent sources of inspiration. But because you're not consciously processing these ideas, you can't access them immediately. That's why it's so important to set time aside for relaxing and goofing around. Those are the moments when you'll have that flash of inspiration. Take it from best-selling author Jonah Lehrer. Like lots of creatives, he says his best insights come when least expected, like when he's relaxing in the bathtub or playing ping pong. Blink number three. Stay creative by combining brutal honesty with the values of love and respect. Creativity means lots of things. One thing it isn't, however, is diplomatic, and it's also not about putting money first. Let's take a closer look at some of the core values of creativity. A good place to start is by saying what you really think. Being creative is about being brutally honest. That's essential in a creative field. Say you're in marketing. You're bound to come across clients who will ask you to promote really bad products. If you're only looking at the bottom line, you might well agree to the commission. Plenty of agencies do exactly that all the time. After all, unhealthy, wasteful, and uninteresting products can be great money makers. But there's a catch. That's a huge waste of creative human resources. You might not land the job if you're brutally honest about what you think of your prospective clients' tacky ideas, but you will save yourself a lot of hassle in the long run. The reward? You can get down to work on something more meaningful. Here are two other core values creatives should take to heart. Love and respect. Whether you're producing brands, products, art installations, or movies, nothing will help you reach and move your audience like love and respect. Humans are hardwired to appreciate these values. The survival of our species depends on it. Because we're not as sturdy as other animals and need others to help us now and then, we're good at spotting these values when they emerge. Say you're making an animated movie purely to cash in. Chances are it'll be pretty generic. Put some love and respect into your work, on the other hand, and it's much more likely that you'll end up with something others will cherish. Think of pioneering creatives like Steve Jobs, the Rolling Stones, or Steven Spielberg. They're revered because the things they created are the result of deep love and respect. That's a great lead to follow. Whatever you're making, these core values should be at the heart of your work. Blink number four. Creativity isn't the fruit of self-conscious creative activity but rather serendipity. History is full of examples of inspiration striking when people stop thinking about the problem that was nagging them. Paul McCartney, for example, hit upon the melody for his famous song Yesterday in a dream. So what does that say about creativity? Well, in order to be truly creative, you need to stop trying to create. Creativity seems to be an area of life in which the Pareto Principle applies. According to the principle, 20% of your work ends up producing 80% of the results. The rest takes up the majority of your time, but leaves you with little to show for your efforts. That might sound strange. After all, isn't creativity also a form of work? Not really. You're most creative when you switch off your prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain responsible for logical tasks like accounting and administration. The reason it's not particularly well-suited to more creative types of work is that it's constantly filtering out information it regards as irrelevant. But that's precisely the kind of information on which creativity thrives. In fact, there's nothing quite like letting thoughts idly mingle to spark the creative thought process. And that's why doing nothing is so important. Whether it's flying a kite or simply lounging in a hammock, switching off the prefrontal cortex is the first step to getting creative. In contrast to the order and organization needed to organize a company's accounts, creativity loves mess. That's why you should embrace the power of randomness, call it serendipity, if you want to nurture your creative side. Take it from Steve Jobs. 
When he dropped out of college, he took a calligraphy course. When he wasn't busy practicing his draftsmanship, you'd often find him hanging out at Macy's in Palo Alto, California, looking at kitchen equipment, especially items produced by the Cuisinart brand. If you're not sure what calligraphy and kitchen equipment have in common, take a look at an Apple product. The company's unique typefaces and fonts, for example, can be traced back to Jobs' course. Then there's the sleek design of its laptops and phones, which riff on exactly the kind of kitchenware he'd spent so long looking at in stores.